Welcome back. I'm Jack Burgess. This time we're going to continue the story of how I finally finished my layout. Sometime back in the 1970s, I found an ad in the back of Trains Magazine for builders' photos of Alco locomotives. The YV had one Alco, and I wrote to the guy and bought a copy of it. And then I wrote back to him and said, any chance you have some erection drawings? And he said he did, but he never thought anybody would ever want erection drawings. Well, yes, I do. So here's the erection drawing that I got. This is the drawing done by Alco of the people that are actually going to build the locomotive. So I was able to use that and create my own drawing of the, the locomotive. And from that, I was actually able to, to draw up some other locomotives because I had the basic information. Fifteen years after I got that drawing, I was able to convince a brass locomotive importer to import YV locomotives. He'd already imported a brass caboose, and when he brought it over for me to do a review, I said, if you ever decide to do locomotives, I've got drawings. And he said, you do? And so he decided to import this locomotive. And so I told him, well, if you decide to do that, I want to buy three of them. And he asked me why, and he said, well, the YV had three locomotives with piston valves, and they were all very similar. And he said, well, what were the differences? So I wrote out a list uh, the, on the Alcos, right at the back of the boiler drops down, Baldwin's does, and so forth. And he sent it to the company who was going to build these, and they said, oh, those are minor, so we'll do all three. And so instead of having to buy 300 of one locomotive, you buy 100 of each. Then he came out with the other two, so I ended up with all five of those. The first three I purchased, the next two he just gave them to me for all the help I'd given. So it was a pretty good deal, except he also came in with factory painted sets and my wife bought all five. In mid-1970s I decided to get started designing what would be my ultimate layout, which is the one I currently have. Keep in mind, it's in an 18 by 20 garage. There hasn't been a car in that garage since not long after he moved into this house. I also wanted to include a six by 11 shop because this is a house with a master bedroom, two other bedrooms, and I was a single parent to a boy and a girl. So there was no space in the house for it. So I started out, my first thought was, to put a major yard, and by then I had drawings of all the yards and so forth, and put a yard on one side, uh, off of three of the sides, put the shop on the other side. And uh, I realized right off the bat that meant I was not gonna have much distance to run between yards. I have another sketch that I did that I thought, okay, and this was an idea that was in the magazine. Uh, it wasn't my idea, but you start on one side and then you go completely around the room, past the first yard and into the second, all the way around into the third. But that means you're, you have a long running time, but you're not seeing your locomotive, or it's visible behind a yard, and I don't like that. I finally realized I needed a multi-deck layout, and there had been lots of plans for them, but I had never seen one in print of how to do it. So the first thing I had to do was figure out how much distance I needed between the decks to make it work. So I took that switching layout I had, I had not put in a drop ceiling yet, so I hung it over another section of my layout. And I don't know how long it took me before I settled on distances, but I would set it and I would say, well, that's maybe a little bit too low. I'd raise it up. Uh, so back and forth, I think, I don't remember, it's too long ago. But I settled on 16 inches between railhead on one deck and railhead on the next deck. And then the next question was how far off the floor to make the first deck. Because if you want to keep the top deck low, low so you can see it, you got to lower the other one. And now is it getting too low that it doesn't look right? So I settled for 46 inches between the floor and top of rail on the first deck. Now. What I had to do then is, if you keep climbing, 
your upper level is going to get higher and pretty soon it's so high you can't see it. So basically I went around the room level completely into the second yard, Merced Falls, went into a helix, crossed a bridge, climbed up to the second level, and the second level is generally all the same level. So it worked out. So I ended up with a 235 foot long main line. So the next challenge was how to support and actually build a multi-deck layout. Jim Hedeker was actually building his multi-deck layout before I started mine. And as I recall le learning later, staff at Model Railroad Magazine decided someone has to build one of these so that we can pursue and follow this idea. And Hedeker uh, decided on how he was going to do his. And what he basically did, I later found out, is he had kind of like a picnic table. So there was a deck here, here, and up here. Here's drawings of what I did. These were in an article in RMC in May 1982. It shows the first deck, second deck. Some of the things I did, one is you don't want to have a lot of room between the second deck rails and the bottom of the fascia because then that fascia is making your scene on the lower level more restricted. So these were all compromises, but the design itself worked out well. You'll see on this drawing that I also had a optional way to tie it to the, the wall, but I didn't do that. I put it on my drawing because this is a drawing that was in the magazine and other people might follow the ideas, but I was still renting this house. And so I needed to design my layout so it could be moved. And I talked about that in another video when we got underneath the layout and so forth and saw how I set it up so it could be taken apart. That upper level was, fortunately, because it's up in the hills, I was able to, to hold the, the boards for the track on profile boards. So here's looking up under the layout and you can see what I'm talking about. This drawing shows what I did on the peninsula where I didn't have the option of hooking it to the wall, but I used two legs and then brought it up. And so the second level is counterbalanced by a level on the other side, if there is one. So I finally finished my drawings. RMC published them in their November 1980 issue. Here's plans that were used in RMC last year, and I gave them my drawings. They redid them, put them in color. So starting on this drawing, this is the lower level. On the left-hand side, you'll see the town of Merced. That's where things start. That's the end of the railroad. They follow along the back wall through Edendale, and then into Merced Falls. At Merced Falls, you go into a helix to pick up some elevation cross over at Exchequer Reservoir on a bridge, and then go behind Merced to reach the second deck. I think what a lot of people would do there is make it visible, but what I didn't want to do was have visible track there because an operator doing switching there, and this is a, one of the two major places where you build a train, that extra level would really make it harder to believe you were really there. It would interfere with the thought. The downside is you're going behind the layout and you don't know what, if your train's moving or not, but fortunately they were all sound equipped so you can hear your train making that, that grade up to the second level where it comes out. So looking at this drawing, up at the top, you see where it says down to and so forth. That's where you pop in view again. You go through Bagby, Emory, incline, and then there is a hidden loop that gets you into El Pertel. The reason I had to do that is on my original drawing, I had a Y where this Y is shown, but this loop that's out here wasn't there. And so you have to come into El Pertel locomotive first, unless you've turned on the Y. And so I had to have a way to keep going and get into El Pertel with the engine still leading. One other thing I didn't even notice until I was looking at these this morning 
is the artist, the, the company that owns RMC is in the Midwest. And they took my drawings and fancied them up. You notice they have trees everywhere and everything is green. No, in California it's yellow. <laughs> Not shown in these drawings is one more level, and that's the logging area, which you can see in this photo. That's at the very top. You can't see it unless you're standing on a step stool. I don't operate it. When I built it, my thought was to actually have somebody running a shea up there, picking up loaded cars, taking them out the incline. Someone else would actually work the incline, hook a car up, brought it down. And I realized nobody would like to do that. That would be too boring. So. Uh, my Shea has only operated probably three or four times running one length to the other, and it's been sitting there ever since. All the multi-deck bench work on the layout was built within the first four months. Then I started laying track. All the track is hand laid, including all the turn turnouts, and even the hidden track is all hand laid. I've never used flex track in my life, and I had all of the main line done within a year hand laid. Also, I've never had problems with derailments on my layout. And one of the things I learned is how to build turnouts and what was critical. This book was given to me by the children whose father was a section foreman on the YV and they lived upstairs in the Bagby Hotel. They gave me this book and here's a drawing out of this book which gives you the official names of a turnout. I discovered that if the lead rails, which connect to the points in the frog, are aligned exactly in line with the frog and everything is engaged, I didn't need guardrails. So I didn't put guardrails on my turnouts until years later because I didn't need them. Everything was staying on the track. So that also has helped eliminate derailments. So here's a photo of a portion of the layout two and a half years after I started. You can see I've Got all the scenery started, roughed in, so forth. And I finally finished all the passing tracks and yard tracks in 1989, nine years after I started. On this layout, I used 22 inch curves, just like I did on my test layout, with spiral easements. And a few years before I started working on the railroad, my little railroader had a template for a spiral curve in a fold out in their magazine which I used. If you Google Model Railroad Magazine Spiral Curve Templates, you'll get a bunch of examples of how to do them. Some people say, oh, all you gotta do is say, take a track here and track and then bend a, a piece of wood, you know, thin piece of wood, and that'll give you a spiral, which it does. But having a template where it actually th goes from no curve to infinite and then back down to 22 is even better. John Armstrong, in his book, Track Planning for Operations, mentioned that if you're going to have 22-inch radius curves, you should consider using number five turnouts, which are sharper than a lot. Number four is really sharp. That's what you would probably find in a train set. A lot of guys might use number sixes. Uh, if you're running passenger equipment, you might want number eights. Uh, I'm happy with the number fives, but the one thing that they look pretty sharp, and they are. If you use a number five, the tracks pull away at an angle like this. And if you're using, say, number eights, they're going like this. So it takes more distance before you've got enough room to clear a train. So I'm good with number fives because I didn't, want, I didn't have room for make my yards longer. But after I finished all the track, Tony Custer mentioned that you can still number, use a number five frog, but you can move your points further back and it makes it look much smoother. So after I learned that is when I got rid of my shop and was able to build El Pertel. And on that one, you can see here how these look much nicer and smoother than the same number fives over here in Merced. I want to mention a few things about scenery on this layout. When I started this one, there were a lot more flocking materials available, different colors and so forth. So what I did is I figured out 
how much flocking I was going to need for the entire railroad, and I bought it in bulk. I bought it, I don't remember where I bought it, it must have been from overseas, but instead of a little bags like this, I had a bag like this. And then I took a photo of what the grass should look like to a paint dealer and bought house paint to match that color. So that meant, and I knew ahead of time I was going to have to paint all of it. Even if I had yellow, I was going to have to paint all that grass. What I had was green, and so I airbrushed all of the grass in, around the entire layout. So here's a photo of the grass on my current layout. Looks pretty good. Here's another photo of my layout. This is one that I took myself. It's probably my favorite photo I've ever taken of my layout. Lou Sassy came over several years before this. I took this photo uh, to do some photos for publicity for a national convention out here. And he came over to my layout, took some photos. And on one of them, he had his lights up and his camera all, everything was wired. And he said, do you have a, an extra tree or anything? Because what he was having was the lights were burning out real close to the camera. And so I held up something cast a shadow and took care of the problems. So that's what I did on this photo here. All the shadow you see in the front is from holding up a tree or something. A couple of years ago, I was asked to do a article on my layout for a, a magazine in Switzerland. And so I did the article, gave them a bunch of photos. This is one of the photos that I gave them. And apparently somebody in their office decided that I had screwed up the lighting because everything was yellow and uh, it should be green. And so they took my photo and made the grass green. And here's that photo that was in the magazine for my article. Uh, <laughs> there was nothing I could do about it. You know, it's too late, but uh, I did save it to be able to talk about it. Besides the yellow grass, there are some trees. Out in the San Joaquin Valley, there are very few trees except around rivers. As you get further up in the elevation, they have live oak trees. Here are a couple photos of live oak trees taken during field trips. This one is a Merced River Canyon near Bagby. The person is walking along what was the grade, kind of. You can see a bridge in the background. The trees up in the upper left corner are live oaks. And actually this person that's there, flies over for these events. He lives in the Netherlands. He comes over each year when we have these get-togethers. Here's another photo. This one is taken down closer to the Merced River in Snelling. You can see the trees are getting pretty good size here. And as they get older, the branches get closer and closer to the ground. These things live between 150 and 300 years before they fall over or die or something. So um, they can get quite huge. About this time, the favorite way of making trees, unless you made an arbiter or something, uh, if you want to use natural materials, was sagebrush. I had seen trees made out of sagebrush, and to me the texture was not correct. You can actually see on a sagebrush kind of lines going up. But the person that wrote that first book on the Yosemite Valley Railroad, Hank Johnston, was also a model railroader, and his favorite thing to do was to make trees. He lived up in the mountains with no trees around, and he would go outside and study a tree and make a model of that tree. And so he told me that what I should be looking for is bitter bush. It grows on the east side of the Sierras in kind of a desert-like area. So we went over there, and it grows in the same areas as sagebrush. It'd be sagebrush here and bitter bush here, probably about even quantities. And so I went over and got a lot, a lot of bitter bush and started making my own trees. But when I got all done, I wasn't that satisfied with them. They were pretty good, uh, better than my other choices. But then I found a guy that was making trees. That's all he did is make trees and sell them. I would see him at railroad shows and go over. I would actually go there early, get in and buy all the trees that looked had the right colors for live oaks. And then I would go to the hobby shop and sometimes there were some there and I'd buy some. So finally my wife got frustrated with me and said, why don't you just buy all the trees you need from him? So I went out to my layout with a clipboard, another location, so-and-so bridge, left end, need uh, an eight-inch tree or six-inch tree or whatever. Got around my layout, added them up, 
$400 worth of trees. Just buy them. So I ordered them. I think it took him at least two months. What he was doing was using thick cotton thread with white glue to form the arbitures, and then he would add the foliage. So here's a picture of my trees, and here's a picture of his trees. Once I got all those trees installed, next time I went to the hobby shop, I bought another tree. But I brought it home, and I could not find a place for it. And uh, so I don't know where it is now. Uh, last time I saw it, I was using it to make a shadow in that one photo. We had a rule when our kids were growing up that you could live here until you were 25. And after 25, go live with your girlfriend or get a job or do something. All of them moved out before they were that age. But once the last child moved out of this house, my wife suggested that I take over the extra bedroom and the biggest bedroom for my shop. That's where you are now. So that, when I took the shop out of the layout room, I now had a lot more room to, to model. And it did two things. One of them I would have never done. I, I don't think I ever would have thought of it if I was having that space initially. But what I was able to do is build El Pertel nearly full size in HO. If I'd gone wall to wall, it would have been full size for everything. I had a lot of depth I could have used, but I didn't. And so what happens now is you walk into the room and you're not right in front of a layout. You actually can stand there and look at the entire room. So that really worked out well. So uh, once I had that space, I laid all that track, built the buildings needed for that, did the scenery. At that point, I had one more building to do over on the, uh, the rest of the layout. It was a, a water tank, which was not easy to build, but fortunately there was an article on how to build one in one of the magazines. Once I did that, I installed it and realized the layout was done 31 years after I started. In 1906, I purchased an Yosemite Valley. 1906 you purchased? <laughs> okay. Wow, you've been around the walk. I mean, I knew you were old, but I didn't think you were that old. <laughs> okay. You sure to change? Sure to change your clothes? You sure to change your diaper? <laughs> In the mid 1920s. <laughs> did it again. Is that like when you got that thing in oh. 1906? Well, actually, it's the 1970s. Okay, 1970s. Can you write that down? <laughs> no, no, oh. no. That's all the time we have for this episode. <laughs> you said it and I... I, I took... forgot what I said. But... <laughs> uh... <laughs> I started to say that's all the time we have. What... That's all we have time for. One more time. <laughs> I did it again.